The history of Formula One goes much deeper than the official start of the championships we know and love today. In order to get a sense for what Formula One is at its root, it makes the most sense to break down the name. But in order to do that, we have to go back in time. Single-seater racing had been taking place throughout the 1900s, and as technology was advancing, so were the risks. Elite racing series and events began to spring up as automobiles got quicker and drivers wanted to go faster. One of the original elite racing series was the European Drivers' Championship, which held its first season in 1931. The governing body that supervised some of the most popular racing events began to impose strict regulations on competitive events like size of the car, engine power, and even the weight of the cars to ensure safe race conditions. But this was also a way to mitigate any unfair advantages that were being leveraged by those who could innovate significantly faster than the field. For instance, that first European Drivers' Championship imposed many regulations, like a minimum car weight of 900 kilograms. These early regulations were in line with what was called Formula Libre regulations, and it's widely considered the oldest sanctioned formula recognized in motorsports. And that's where the name Formula comes from. Therein lies the root of the name of the entire series. But just as things were picking up, global motorsports was interrupted by an armed conflict. A second world war later, and Europe was ready to race again. But to distinguish the top-level Formula cars from the rest of the racing events, Formula One regulations were formed in 1946 by the official governing body, the FIA, and the races beginning that same year. But that's not the only set of regulations that were codified. Formula Two regulations were formed by the FIA in 1948 and was limited to two liter 750 cc supercharged engines. Just a couple of years after that, an even smaller engine was officially designated for Formula Three by the FIA with 500 cc engines powering this formula. Because of the advanced engineering required to compete in the top formula, teams struggled to field a car in the premier category and Formula 2 rules were even used for a couple of seasons in the early days of the championship. This dynamic exists still today, but has morphed into the series under Formula 1 acting as a feeder series where younger drivers can prove that they can be successful in Formula 1. But by the mid-1950s, the championship was more steady and teams began to consistently compete in Formula 1. Throughout the 1950s, there was only one championship that recognized the driver who placed the highest. For each Grand Prix finished, they were given an allotment of points that would conclude with the crowning of the driver with the most points as Formula One champion. Now that teams could build race cars that could make it through the season, they could field more than one car. It would take until the end of the 1950s, but the FIA designated a second championship that was technically separated from the driver's championship. It was designed to reward the team with the most points as the winning team or the winning constructors. Thus, the constructors championship was born and the inaugural champion was Van Wall, crowned in 1958. So now that we've talked about the history of Formula One and how it began, let's fast forward to modern day Formula One. F1 is big business. The FAA is much larger than just simply the Formula One World Championships. That has always been true and remains true today. For instance, here's a list of other sanctioned World Championship events under the FAA umbrella. And while the FAA is the governing body, F1 is owned by the Formula One group. Just recently in 2016, Liberty Media bought the controlling interest for billions of dollars. So if you hear the name Liberty, they are the American company that actually owns the underlying rights. You can even go and buy yourself a piece of it at the NASDAQ under the ticker FWONK. Like I said, big business. Alongside Formula One in the group's business portfolio are the Atlanta Braves baseball team and Sirius XM. Oftentimes major changes to the sport are a reflection of the larger picture shifting. This is all relevant to new fans or long-term fans not privy to the shifting business side of F1. If you ever feel like there's an invisible hand, there is, and its name is Liberty Media. Teams, tech, drivers, and cars. For the 2020 season, the grid will be made up of 10 teams. Over the years, there's been an ebb and flow of the number of teams on the grid. Each team, or constructor, fields two cars. According to the rules, each constructor must produce a chassis to which they own the underlying IP and develop themselves. Just a convoluted way to say, they built it. Just as we discussed the history of Formula One and those earlier Libre Formula regulations, there still exist limitations on power. Now, more than ever, many of the technical advancements are being monitored. And while, of course, we're not going to go over every single rule that the FAA has put forth for Formula One racing, I will link to it down in the description below. Feel free to head to that link, grab it, download it, use it throughout the season because these regulations do change and they do matter. 
Something that is understood widely but never actually mentioned is some of the best innovations truly come from finding gaps in these regulations that have not been covered off yet. To put it cynically, finding loopholes really is the job of the technical directors of F1 teams. A great example of this played out recently with the Mercedes Dual Access Steering Mechanism, or simply DOS. The FIA deemed it would be allowed for this season, and the loophole was close, making dual access steering unavailable beyond 2020. But let's go back to the chassis. So while each team must produce one, the rules do allow for each team to purchase an engine. Technically, these are referred to as power units due to the multiple sources of power flow that releases an incredibly high amount of brake horsepower. Over the years, there have been major changes to technical rules that go as far as to change the type of engine used by each team. We're in the final year of what is called the turbo hybrid era, and there are many eras that represent the type of engine being used mostly. And while these names aren't technically designated officially, they've just become known as such. This era began in 2014 due to the introduction of the 1.6 liter turbocharged V6. It was accompanied by the Energy Recovery System, or simply ERS, which supplies extra BPH through electric motors. Because the internal combustion engine is supplying power to the car in conjunction with the ERS supply, this is now why you'll hear power units being used instead of engines. In terms of power and tech, we are going to stop there. If you're sitting there thinking, oh, that sounded really confusing, well, that's because it is. You're not crazy. And it's wildly expensive to be able to successfully develop these power units. It takes experience, resources, and heaps of cash. But if you get it right, it's precisely the kind of advantage that leads to teams dominating these quote-unquote eras. If you've ever looked through the record books, you'll notice that a driver or a team will go through spells where they dominate and then sometimes, out of nowhere, they fall off. To put it simply, and this isn't always true, but more times than not, they didn't adapt well to the new regulations. In the last decade, only two teams won the Constructors' Championship, and just three different drivers won a Drivers' Championship. Red Bull with Sebastian Vettel dominated from 2010 to 2013 with their design. Then, the regulations changed in 2014, and Mercedes unleashed their powerhouse power unit in overall unstoppable design with Lewis Hamilton shining for the rest of the decade, only to be interrupted by his 2016 teammate, Nico Rosberg, in the twin car. And if you are a new fan, well, you came at the right time because we are on the eve of a brand new era. And the next era is meant to bring the teams closer together and create more racing opportunities. So there's going to be a number of regulation changes kicking off in 2021. Now, because of everything I just described, some teams find it impossible to be able to develop for years ahead of a change to anticipate what is to come. In 2020, there are only three constructors on the grid that actually make their own power unit. The rest are customers of these teams. And Red Bull and the sister car actually being slightly different in that both of these teams get their engines from Honda, who doesn't actually field a team, but technically, Red Bull and AlphaTauri do not actually make their own engines. Occasionally, and actually this is how it is on the Formula One website itself, you will see teams referenced by their chassis engine combination nomenclature. So you'll notice the chassis first with the power unit provider afterwards. For example, Red Bull Racing Honda or Racing Point BWT Mercedes. While naturally there's perks of being a customer team that purchases their power unit from a manufacturer, especially in the cost and reliability front, there's major drawbacks, and chief among them, the chassis power unit integration. The better you can make these two things work together, the better your aerodynamics are going to be on your car. Becoming a powerful team in F1, especially if you aren't a larger team that can afford R&D, would require major innovations and it would likely be in the aero department. If you are a team getting your power from somewhere else, you have to fit the engine style, size, weight distribution, etc. All on top of a chassis you are building specifically for your car and your aerodynamics. Customer teams do certainly get the same engine as their manufacturer and partner, but it doesn't mean the same output. Red Bull, for instance, is known for a strong chassis. Therefore, despite them being powered by Renault in 2018, they had an advantage over their works team. But you're not really going to see Haas ever beat Ferrari anytime soon. Conversely, this played out very famously and very publicly with McLaren when they were powered by Honda during the Alonso days. McLaren wanted to run what they called a size zero concept. But because they weren't actually making their own power unit, they had to work with whatever Honda gave them. And yes, they'd be working closely with Honda, but it still is not the same. Imagine how much more easy it would have been had McLaren just built the exact power unit to fit their own concepts. It's a lot easier said than done as we discussed. As the rules move towards quote unquote limiting outright power and spend, a lot more about the F1 car is being standardized. While power units will never truly be standardized, a vast majority of the loopholes able to be exploited will close and innovations will bring power units closer together. So it's reasonable to think that a fairly standard power unit is on the horizon. Because of this dynamic, you'll often see teams referred to as one of the following. Top three, 
As of right now, that's Ferrari, Mercedes, and Red Bull. They are the top teams, quote unquote. A midfield team, or best of the rest, or formerly the 1.5, these are the teams outside of the top three teams, which again, Ferrari, Mercedes, and Red Bull. So when you hear a driver or team being referred to as getting the best of the rest, it really means they got fourth if it's a team or seventh if it's a driver. And the last tier, backmarkers. Now, this can change depending on the race and how they're running, but it's usually pretty evident who the bottom tiers are. The technical term backmarkers represents those that are being passed by the leaders. They're being lapped, essentially. There are flags that can be shown to those drivers, essentially asking them, hey, can you move aside and let the leaders through if they are impeding any action at the top? And this is the blue flag. A bit of bias here, but personally, I don't like the blue flag, but I understand why it's there and some people do. One of the main reasons it's there also is to make sure that there's no fixing of any of the races. There's no one working together to slow another driver down. Because F1 really is a ruthless, ruthless sport, and not just with your other competitors, with your teammates. It's especially ruthless with your teammates. And while it's pretty intuitive, just like any other sport, teammates should be working together. They'd be amicable. But that's where Formula 1 deviates from normal sport. Formula 1 is unique in that realm in that your teammate is actually your fiercest rival on track. Because each of the teams are fielding two drivers, and there's so many different types of cars with different types of parts, upgrades, varying degrees of packages, power, etc., it's hard to compare apples to apples. The only true way that one driver can fairly assess his or her pace and the technology they are given is to look at their teammate. They have the same exact car. If you are consistently losing to your teammate in more than a few cents off in one lap qualifying pace, well then that's one of the only important and reasonable objective measures by which your worth is determined as a driver. But don't get me wrong, there's been plenty of teammates that get on just fine. Just because someone's your fiercest rival doesn't mean it has to get nasty, but it's often the way it goes. It mostly rears its head with the top three teams. It's not really commonly referred to though because no top driver on one of those top three teams wants to be referred to as a second driver. As you go down the midfield, that battle for supremacy could be turned into, well, a good thing. It could be something that elevates performance, so long as they don't actually make contact and ruin the team's chances for gaining points. And that's the big takeaway here, the confusing thing that no one actually says out loud. There's only one winning strategy per team. Both cars can't win. So the top teams have to pick the driver in the most favorable position to win or whatever maximized team points. Tire Talk there are a litany of other technical factors that affect the race car, but none more than the tires as it relates to things the team have control over and can adjust strategically. Now don't get me wrong, there's plenty of other nuances that have significant impact on the race, but this is a good starting point. Through Formula 1's history, tire manufacturers have changed in rules surrounding them with it. Currently, Pirelli is the only tire manufacturer on record for the entire grid. There was a time in Formula 1 though, when there was more than one tire manufacturer on the grid. It led to a very weird, Controversial six-car start at the 2005 U.S. Grand Prix. I've actually made a video about this, so you can find that in the upper right-hand corner, just up there, a little I with a circle around it. You can click it, copy it, open a new tab, whatever you want to do. But let's get back to tires. The 2020 Pirelli compounds come in the form of five different compounds in three different colors. So let's pay attention here. You have C1, which is the hardest compound. C2, the second hardest compound. C3, the most medium compound. C4 the second softest compound, and C5, the softest compound. Each compound yields a different level of performance. The simplest way to put this is, the harder the compound, the slower it is on pace thanks to the grip, or lack thereof in this case of the C1 tire. But with that comes durability. So while the harder compounds are slower because they can't grip the track and improve cornering speeds as much as, say, a C5 compound, this lack of grip is also directly responsible for what is typically called tire degradation or most simply referred to as DEG, D-E-G. Each team is given the same exact tires in terms of performance. That is, Mercedes doesn't have any better tire than Williams in any way, shape, or form. How it works is Pirelli will elect a range of compounds that each of the teams are permitted to use. The range will span three of the compound grades. For instance, 2019 Russian Grand Prix, Pirelli nominated C2, C3, and C4 compounds. But at the 2019 Monaco Grand Prix, they elected C3, C4, and C5. The compounds are always in succession like that. Hey you, yes, you. Are you paying attention? Because it's about to get a little bit confusing. Make sure to be watching. Here's where the colors start to come into play. So I just described all of the compounds, and in an effort to make things simple as you're watching the race, Pirelli have stuck to three different compound colors. The softest compound at that specific Grand Prix is labeled the red compound. 
The medium is the yellow compound, and the hardest compound available at that Grand Prix is white tipped. But the tire colors themselves do not represent compound grades directly. This really only changes slightly for the medium compounds. For instance, let's use the exact same example we used above. Here are the compound grades, but now we've added those respective colors that are appropriate so that when you're watching, you know whether that's the hard, soft, or medium tire. Notice how in the example you see here, Monaco has a C3 tire, which was the hard grade, white tipped, but in Russia, C3 is the medium yellow. These different changes to tire allocation across circuits are called steps. Pirelli has a very rigorous standard to decide what circuits get what compounds and if they should make a step up from the previous year. The ultimate goal of Mario Asola, head of Pirelli F1, is to create interesting racing possibilities with the tire compounds while maximizing a stable race for the teams. This gives teams who may not always have the car to win to be able to make a strategy choice that may be more advantageous to them. Some of the main ingredients to Pirelli deciding allocation comes down to track characteristics. Here are the five they habitually publicize on their Grand Prix preview. They rank each of these characteristics with a grade of one through five. Tire stress, lateral load, asphalt grip, asphalt abrasion, and downforce. This is a very important and often overlooked part of F1 racing and enjoying it. So if you're interested in this sort of thing, the technical guidelines of the track, what to expect, go in the description, click the link that talks about the race previews and tell me where to send it. And I'll send you all of the previews I make before the actual Grand Prix weekend kicks off. The teams will bring with them a set of tires that matches their potential strategy. These tires have to make it through the full weekend, through the rounds of testing, the race itself, which we'll get to in a second. Usually Pirelli will nominate tires well in advance so the teams can prepare their strategies. They are usually told about five to six Grand Prix ahead. Here's what the nomination schedule will look like for 2019 after it all came in. We've talked a lot about the car and the teams and even about the race weekend now. So let's talk about the race itself. A Formula One Grand Prix takes place over the course of one weekend. There are three practice sessions and a qualifying session. The events are spread out across a weekend like so. FP1 is earlier on a Friday. FP2 is later on a Friday. Saturday hosts two sessions, one practice session and the all important qualifying session while Sunday is official Grand Prix day, and it's almost always a Sunday afternoon. That's the general outline. Now, of course, there's a couple of exceptions to this, and the most major one is the Monaco Grand Prix actually holds FP1 and FP2 on Thursday and resumes again on Saturday as normal. And over the years, F1 has actually adopted some night races. So with that, sessions will hold events in the evening to mirror the actual Grand Prix themselves. These races include Bahrain, Singapore, and Abu Dhabi. Let's talk a little bit more about practice sessions as we're gonna go into the most amount of detail for the Grand Prix weekend. Free practice session one and two both last 90 minutes each. Only in the first free practice session can a test driver be allowed on track to test the car. The third free practice session lasts 60 minutes and is just a couple of hours removed from the actual qualifying session. Between the Friday session and the Saturday session, the teams are allowed to work in the car, but up until a certain point. After that, they're called after hours, and the team will get penalized for that. These free practice sessions don't actually count towards anything in terms of the actual race, but it is a very good time to see how the cars are handling, what driver looks the most comfortable, etc. Much of the first practice session is used to get the drivers re-acclimated to the circuit. This is rarely the first time any of the drivers have actually been on that track, but it is good to return to it. The second free practice session can reveal a lot about the race upcoming. This is where the teams will run the all-important race simulations as well as the qualification simulations. So if you were looking to watch one of the practice sessions to get a true understanding of who's going to win the race, probably the best session to watch is FP2, that Friday session. We move on to Saturday, and after the 60 minutes of FP3 is over, there's about a two-hour break where the cars will turn around and run their cars in the qualifying session. This session absolutely counts and is one of the most exciting parts of the entire Grand Prix weekend. The qualifying session itself is spread out over three sessions that eliminate the slowest drivers as they progress. Inside these sessions, teams can run as many laps as they want, but they have to make sure that they get the fast time in before the checkered flag actually falls. You'll notice many of the teams will wait until late in the sessions to run their times due to what is called track evolution. You'll also hear the term rubbering in, or just rubbered in, after the cars have pushed speeds on the racing line. This increases grip for the following cars. The differences in the times from the cars who actually run first before the rubbering in and the cars who get out latest after the track evolution and rubbering in, these can be pretty substantial sometimes. If you don't have a shot at pole, it's risky. Throughout the practice and qualifying sessions, you'll notice that there are many cars out on track all at once. The later you wait, the more you increase your risk that your lap could be impeded by another driver. It could be deleted, you could just not get a clean run in at all. People have to move out of the way. The cars don't go back to the pit once they run their laps. 
They have to cool the tires, they have to cool the car, and while other cars are doing outlaps, they have their own programs to run, so maybe they're just now getting up to speed. Most drivers do a pretty good job of staying off the racing line and out of the way, and if they don't, they usually get penalized, but it's not always a guarantee. And even if they do get penalized, you still are the one that was left out in the cold. Now let's talk about the specifics as it relates to qualifying, because again, the most exciting part is also one of the most confusing parts. The three sessions are called Qualifying 1, Qualifying 2, and Qualifying 3, and you'll definitely only hear them referred to as Q1, Q2, and Q3. Naturally, Q1 is the first qualifying session and lasts about 18 minutes. All 20 drivers are permitted to enter the stage of qualifying, with each driver having a fair shot at the top, barring any grid penalties they may be under. Q2 is next, so after those 18 minutes from Q1, the five slowest cars are eliminated. They are lined up on the back of the grid in their relative order. Position 20, or more simply P20, is the furthest back, with cars being staggered closer to the control line as their qualifying times improve. In all, the second qualifying session lasts 15 minutes. After that, the five slowest cars are yet again eliminated. Now we're down to 10 cars in one session. Another very important thing to note here is, if you make it to the Q3 session, that is if you are P10 or better, you have to start the race on whatever tires got you into this session. That does really start to matter, especially if you're someone like P11 or P12, you get choice of tires. You have a very strategic advantage over someone who's in P10 or P9 if they're stuck on a strategy that they don't really want to be on. So with only those 10 remaining cars, there are 12 minutes put back on the clock for Q3. It's typical for this session to be split into two, although this is not really official. Now this happens for a number of reasons, but the easiest way to think about it is track evolution. The track gets faster, the longer they wait. That simple. After everyone's final attempt and the checker flag is dropped, whoever has the fastest time, whether it be from provisional or just whoever said it right there at the end of the session, they are on pole, P1. The next placements are staggered across from each other. So if you are on P1 on the right, P2 is on the left, so just a little bit back, P3 staggered back from there, and so on and so forth, all the way until P20 is placed. After the session ends, the teams call it a day and the drivers turn up the next day for the actual race. We've done all of that. We still haven't even raced. The number of laps must exceed 305 kilometers. However many laps it takes to satisfy that, depending on where the race is, that becomes the set number of laps. The exception again here is the Monaco Grand Prix. The race must also not go beyond two hours, barring any major lengthy red flags. As mentioned, the Grand Prix is held most Sunday afternoons unless it's one of the specific night races on the grid. Now throughout the race itself, there are a number of rules that are going to be important to help you understand and enjoy F1 racing, but we're not actually going to get into that portion, but if you'd like it, make sure to request it in the comment section below and download the FIA document which goes through the sporting regulations. But for the most part, once the lights go out, they're just racing. That's something that we all know. Whoever wins, wins. But we're going to talk about the points now. Over time, there's been some pretty substantial changes in the point system, but right now, only the top 10 drivers actually score points and they contribute to the championship tallies. Since 2010, the breakdown is as follows. As you can see here, it gets really difficult after, say, P5 to start amassing any sort of real gap between you and the nearest competitor. And this is exactly why the best of the rest is such an important designation in Formula 1, albeit informal. These points accumulated at each Grand Prix go towards the driver's total for the driver's championship. They are also combined with their teammates to form an aggregate total. This total as a team forms a basis for the constructor's championship. After the race is completed, the top three drivers will have an award ceremony at the event itself. It's there they take part in the famous champagne spray. The logistics of what happened next in Formula 1 could be a video all by itself, but the teams have to pack up immediately after the race and ship everything off to the next destination. Congrats, that's it. You got the basics of Formula 1 down. Again, I repeat, the basics. There are plenty of things that I did not cover, but if you were to watch this video, take notes, you understood everything, you would be able to survive, nay, thrive in a Formula 1 Grand Prix weekend. But let's stay grounded. There are endless amounts of things. I'm even still learning, everyone's still learning. A lot of people always ask me, well, how do I actually go about learning more? But first, to get deeper into F1, you really have to understand what draws you into F1. Your main concern and priority should be just fall deeper in love with the sport. I'll leave a link below as well to the F1 news and the F1 write-ups that I do over on the website, so you can make sure to check those out if that's something you're into. Those will be ramping up significantly the second Melbourne actually is here. With that said, I really appreciate your time, you being here. Thanks for checking this out, and I will be making more videos soon, so subscribe if you like F1 news, and I'll see you very, very soon.